Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, welcome to our SA POCOG uh, webinar on consumer involvement in research. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Paramount people. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you'll work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this uh, webinar. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians to the inclusion and, and empowerment of all people in the country we live in and share together. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of South Australia. Um, so today this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be made available um, soon on the POCOG YouTube channel. So I just wanted everybody who's dialing in to be aware that this is being recorded. Um, if everybody is able to keep their microphones muted, except for when we open up um, discussion at the end of the webinar, that would be really appreciated because it helps to minimize distraction to speakers and listeners. Um, if you'd like to put any questions into the chat um, and then we'll have a little bit of question time after each speaker uh, and then also some time at the end for any general discussion that comes up. Um, so first of all, uh, we've decided that uh, Agustina Gansler will be um, presenting. And so Agustina is uh, from Health Translation SA and she's going to be speaking about the benefits to researchers of consumer engagement, um, a how-to of consumer engagement, and also speak about how Health Translation SA can help with um, assisting consumer involvement in research. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so we can get the slides up. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's um, really exciting to be speaking to such a uh, large and varied group of people. Um, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to acknowledge... I'd uh, first would like to acknowledge that the Ghana uh, people are the traditional... Stop. Sorry, I don't know what just happened. Uh, there's a recording that just started. Um, let me share that again. Sorry about that. Don't know why that started. Um, the ends of the Adelaide region. I'm s I just don't know why there is a recording on this. Let me just stop. I'm just going to mute myself. I wonder actually if we could perhaps reorder the way. Yep. Okay, so if we actually change plans um, and Nadia, if you wouldn't mind presenting first, that might give um, Agustina a little bit of, of time to um, sort through her recording. Sure, not a problem. Thanks, Nadia. Cheers. Let's see how I go. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Is that coming through as a slide show? Yep. You? Excellent. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everyone, and thanks very much to POCOG for the invitation to speak. Um, this is a topic that I'm really passionate about and becoming more passionate about through experience. So I hope that um, what, I'm, what I'm about to share will be um, helpful in some way um, for your journeys. Okay, so just very briefly, I work at the Rosemary Bryant AO Research Centre as a Senior Research Fellow. Uh, the centre formed in 2016 and I started working there in 2017. And Imogen um, was a um, PhD student who also started in 2017. And we were the first and possibly only PhD panel at the uni to include a consumer co-supervisor um, who's Julie Marker. Um, the other supervisor was Marion Eckert, who's the director of the centre, um, and um, Amanda Hutch Hutchinson, who most of you or all of you will probably know, um, uh, was 
also part of the team um, with Julie and I. And so in this presentation, I want to talk a bit about how we got there. Um, and I thought I'd start with a bit of history from the very first engagement I had with consumers and how this lay the foundation for working together as supervisors on a project. I'll talk about how um, we work together as a team in the context of the PhD project. And finally, I'll end with um, what I've learnt or sort of the light bulb moments for me um, through my experience. So to the beginning, um, I moved from in, in 2014, I moved from working in the area of obesity research that was very industry focused um, in an academic setting to working in cancer research for a non for profit organisation. And I had never heard of consumer engagement before. My first contact with consumers was with Cancer Voices SA. I was working on a quality of life and survivorship um, project and we asked Cancer Voices to um, give us some feedback on a survey that we, we had developed as part of this project. And I vividly remember receiving the feedback. It was quite a shock. It really hit me how naive I was um, to some really important issues. And I was really impressed by the feedback. It was really thorough, it was, it was detailed, it was critical, it questioned um, assumptions that, that we'd made. And at the time I remember being quite annoyed as well because I didn't know quite what to do with this. And the project was so far along that it was really difficult to do anything meaningful about some of the important issues that had been raised. So what this taught me was that in general, and me per, for me personally, I needed to approach the research in a slightly different way. But at this stage, it didn't occur to me that this is something I could do with consumers. Um, I was still thinking quite inwardly, although my path had definitely changed as a result of this experience. I was much more open to the idea of doing things differently. And so over the next, three years, um, you know, I kept sort of working in that area of research and I began to notice consumers at conferences, at symposiums, at workshops, and I made an effort to, to, talk, to talk to people, um, to get to know them, um, sometimes talking about the research, sometimes just talking about general things. And so this kind of non-strategic um, kind of contact happened quite often over um, a period of, of three years. Um, so I have to say this, this period of experience for me, I, I definitely didn't know what I was doing. I was a, I was a little bit um, sort of wandering aimlessly and, and cluelessly to some degree. And so then an, opportun an, op an opportunity presented and it felt like the stars aligned. What happened was UniSA had an internal funding scheme that they were offering for PhD support, top up support for a project that was multidisciplinary and that had a strong um, end user engagement. And they were really interested in projects that would strengthen partnerships. And so we thought um, that this was a good idea to reset the research agenda. Um, bring together some people that whose paths had crossed in, in different ways um, to come together and kind of work on this project um, from, from the beginning with consumers. And yes, we're really fortunate to receive the funding from the uni and this was a huge motivator because um, we knew there would have been many applications with commercial industry partners that would have been quite strong. So obviously we had actually made a very good case for the importance of, um, of this research and working with consumers. And it felt like this was the right time for us to come together. Um, okay, so there were five of us, um, which is quite, quite, a, quite a big team for supervisors and a student across different discipline areas. Um, 
this is the way UniSA sort of does PhDs now with a panel, um, which can be quite challenging with such a large team. So I wanted to talk about how we worked together. And I've used the Tuckman model, um, which some of you might have heard about. It's been around for a long time and it's used a lot in um, teaching people about team, de team development and, and leadership coaching and the like. And I think this is really kind of a nice way of explaining how, how we performed as a team. So what happens is it starts with the forming phase. That's where people come together and you work out your goals and what, what you're trying to do. Um, then comes the storming phase, which is about working out how you're going to work together. And this is where things can go a bit funny and, um, you know, kind of conflict and tension can arise. And if you get through this stage, and it's not a given, um, according to some of the literature, you go through the norming phase, which is where people start um, settling into their roles. Um, you're starting to perform quite well as a group, but it's a period where people are treading carefully and not wanting to, to rock the boat too much. It's sort of a polite cooperation period. And then the, the ideal is that you reach a stage where you're performing, um, which is where people are confident in their roles, very focused on the goal. Um, motivation is high and um, people are working together, but also independently and not afraid to raise contrary, contrary ideas and to push the boundaries. Um, and then there's the adjourning phase, which just reflects that projects eventually come to an end and the team disbands. Okay, so we were very excited to have, have formed a team, um, the five of us. Um, and I guess what, what helped us to, I think, form effectively was, well, there are a few things. I think one was that we had set aside in some ways all of the research that we had done previously and decided to reset and reconsider the goals together as a group. Um, and we weren't too prescriptive about our roles. And this is something that um, Amanda, Amanda Hutchinson really helped us with at the beginning um, to say that we're, we're all going to work on this together, but there will be times when some people, you know, step in and do a little bit more in some areas. And, you know, we have the flexibility to put our hand up to be more involved in some areas and perhaps less involved in other areas, but we wouldn't actually force those roles too much at the start. Um, so as I mentioned, storming is a normal process and I think we stormed in a really productive way. Um, we decided very early on that we would all be involved in every meeting. Um, we encouraged robust and respectful discussion, um, making sure that everyone's opinion was sought, um, considered that everyone's opinion counted, and we're very open to learning from um, one, one another Another. So our experience was very sort of positive and productive in terms of the storming. One thing that I think helped and um, that I think makes the PhD model quite a useful um, activity for um, researchers and consumers to work together on is that you're at an equal level as you're all supervisors. And so that, that does, I think, really um, change the dynamics and, and it is really positive. Um, influence. And we, because of the PhD model as well, um, you've got, you've certainly got a lot of time, a bit more time than perhaps with some other projects, but also some of the boundaries and constraints of the PhD do help to keep you quite focused. Um, for example, um, this Projects need to be feasible, they need to be completed by the student in, in, a, in the time frame. the research needs to be of high quality, it needs to be um, able to be published, and that also helps in the storming phase to keep everybody sort of focused on making sure that the needs of the student are met and prioritised. After the storm comes the, the norming, and um, Again, with the PhD, you do have a bit of time to norm um, and slowly build um, a deeper understanding of each other's skills and knowledge and what they can contribute to the project. 
and this occurs sort of gradually over the course of the projects that um, you know the student undertakes. So we discovered that um, it was really helpful not to have roles that were too prescribed because that meant that we were all able to participate um, and bring our skills when it made sense to do so. What Imogen and Julie did is they um, got together and they at the towards the end of the PhD and documented very carefully all of the different ways that um, Julie and consumers um, more broadly were involved in the research and what the impact of that involvement was. Um, I could spend an entire presentation talking about that um, and I'm happy to share further information, but it was, we spent a lot of time documenting that um, process and impact. And that's something that I think is worthwhile for teams um, to do, because it really does help you to understand what value um, uh, the consumer involvement sort of brought to the research. And we found it was quite extensive, as you can see across number, a number of areas, the consumer involvement was really important to um, the, the sort of the quality and the process, the interpretation and the dissemination um, of the research throughout all stages. So after norming comes performing um, and you know, hopefully, hopefully teams get to the performance stage, although again, that's not a given. Um, and in many ways, what I talked about in the norming phase speaks to performing as well, as we were talk, um, you know, all of the areas of consumer involvement and impact um, are examples of, of performing. But what I wanted to highlight here was that the um, consumer involvement in the research really did um, improve the overall quality of the research and that was recognised um, um, by um, you know external external awards um, including um, Imogen being recognised as a PhD student of the year in 2019 so that was across the entire university um, it's a, a, an Australian award with the Booper Health Research Grant and an inter international award um, through MASK we were able to publish successfully in high quality journals, um, received invitations to speak. And also throughout the PhD, there was interest from cancer organisations um, on the work that we were doing and how that might um, be useful in terms of like policy and practice and further dissemination. So what the consumer involvement was really critical in doing was making sure that the the technical quality of the research and then the meaningfulness of the research came together and that was recognised um, by our peers. And this is really important, you know, in terms of um, early, early career um, research opportunities and receiving funding for um, further research to, you know, to pursue further research in the area. As we know, every um, project comes to an end and um, we are celebrating the end of this wonderful partnership um, with Imogen's uh, PhD graduation ceremony tomorrow. Um, but we also continue to partner in many ways. For example, Julie has initiated a survivors and researchers walk and talk where researchers from different institutions in SA get together on Fridays and we discuss um, research and collaboration opportunities. We also get together um, to discuss um, ideas or to brainstorm uh, res possible research in new areas and we do this informally. Um, Julie's really great at brokering collaboration between researchers. As she works with so many different researchers, she can see where what one person is doing might be um, relevant to another person's work. Um, and we have established some new collaborations through, um, through those mechanisms. And we just have established a kind of informal um, uh, strategy for sharing information and supporting each other um, that just happens quite sort of naturally and organically. So even though the project that we work together formally has come to an end, we still continue 
to collaborate. So what I've learned is that um, I'm still learning all the time um, in, in, in about how to do consumer engagement well. It's important to um, be open and authentic um, and you know regardless of of how confident you are in what you're doing those qualities will, will see you well remember to build a strong foundation um, by um, you know getting to know the consumers who have an interest in the research that you're doing um, and you know finding the people that you enjoy working with and you think you might enjoy working with on a more formal basis. Um, maintain contact and communication with those people, even informally, because you never know what opportunities will present and when the stars will align for you. And just remember that meaningful partnerships do take time. It is difficult to fit it in um, as we have so many competing demands. Um, but I would recommend you making the time and the effort because um, the reward is, is um, is, is fantastic and um, you know, it's something that um, you, your, your investment will definitely be, be rewarded. So thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you very much, Nadia, for your presentation. Um, I, it was really good to hear a little bit more about the actual process of um, how you kind of built your team, including Julie as a consumer and um, the steps in, I guess, um, going through that that sort of the the Tuckman model, if you like, of kind of building the team and working on the project. Um, I'd just like to let anyone who, who dialed in a little later know that if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat box. Um, but we don't have any in there yet, Nadia. So I thought just to begin with, um, would you um, like to offer your opinion on perhaps what is the most challenging stage as you move through that Tuckman model um, with regard to, to building a team, including um, a consumer supervisor? I think the, most, the, the challenging part is the forming part. And I think that's the most important to get mm. right. I think where we, where we go wrong, um, and it's not anyone's fault, is that um, as researchers, you're, you have your, your area and often your ideas are quite formed and sometimes projects have moved along um, and so you, yep. you then come together at a funny point um, so for us I think stepping back going back to the beginning was really important and setting the agenda and the goals together that's not I think that's hard to do I think they're practical you know just it doesn't it, it's not easy to do although I think groups should try and do it because you start off on the right with the right foundation if you do it that way. Um, otherwise, I think the storming is going to be much more challenging um, and, and everything else will sort of flow from there. So the most important is the forming. And that's where I think building partnerships, sort of um, not rushing the, the partnerships, but building relationships, building an understanding, just getting to know people um, in your area, I think really helps to lay the foundation. So when you do work together, um, you can sort of start on the right, on the right foot. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Nadia. Much appreciated. Um, Agostina, how are you going? Should we return to your talk or should we? <laughs> All right, wonderful. Happy, um, happy to continue. I'm sorry about that. I think um, um, some slides that I had used for another presentation somehow kept the recording. So anyway, um, thank you again for having me. Um, I think my presentation really ties in nicely with what Nadia has just presented. Uh, Nadia showed a lot of the, I guess, in action uh, examples of some of the things that I'll, um, that I'll be talking about. But before I start, I just want to acknowledge that I'm currently standing on the lands of the Ghana people, and they are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region, and I recognize their cultural, spiritual, and physical and emotional connection to the land. I honor and pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and to generations of Ghana people now and into the future. 
Before I start um, and dive into my content, I just wanted to give a, a, a summary of who we are at Health Translation SA and what our role is with regards to consumer engagement in research. Um, we're a National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, so an NHNMRC accredited uh, health translation center. Um, HTSA provides a focal point for a statewide collaborative cross-sectoral approach to research and to the translation of evidence into practice. So we know that um, consumer and community engagement in research can um, have really positive benefits for research. And it's been shown that it can improve the translation of a research project into practice by you know, remaining uh, relevant and um, addressing the actual community's needs. Um, at HTSA, we partner with eight academic research and healthcare agencies, and we encompass really the full breadth of health service delivery across SA. So we partner with all the universities, the PHNs, um, and we provide support to these organizations with regards to different aspects of research translation, consumer engagement being one of them. So that's where we sit. Um, consumers, well, at HGSA, we use different definitions. So we have consumers and community members. Consumers are the people who have a lived experience of a health issues and have consequently been a consumer of health and medical services, but it also includes patients, their friends, families, and carers. The community is broader, so it encompasses a general public or a subgroup of people sharing a common interest about a topic, or if they're part of you know, a social group, a po political group, um, or um, within a geographic area. And so we often use the term community engagement here at, at HTSA and uh, at SAMRI, which is where we're located. Um, we talk about community engagement and research, but what is it? Nadia really, really uh, illustrated that really well, that it's a partnership. Um, it's doing re research with, um, with or by members of the public rather than doing research to or about or for them. It's really including community members and consumers as stakeholders or as you know another partner around the table um, and you know um, taking decisions and uh, discussing um, the project itself. The work that we do here at HTSA is based on six community engagement principles. And these essentially um, also reflect really well what uh, Nadia showed is that this partnership, this work that we do between researchers and community members is based on reciprocal relationships. It's um, the work that we do is based on a partnership and mutual respect. Um, it's a, a, an area of work where we can, um, you know, learn from each other um, and include um, include people that um you know are affected by the research that we do um, and so community members can and should be involved across all stages of research um, when we do community engagement and research it's important that community members are kept informed about how their input uh, influences research it's important to remain transparent remain honest and it's an opportunity for everyone not just consumers but researchers as well to um, develop their capacity, their abilities, and their skills. So not only will um, you know, engagement in research um, develop research literacy, literacy skills for community members, but it also develops the researcher's skills in communication, forming a team of uh, people with varied backgrounds, um, you know, working together, and learning about their research topic in a different way. Community engagement is not just disseminating research findings. So it's not saying, oh, I published my research, I'll, I'll tweet it, or I'll, I'll send it to a peak body organization, and then these, these results have been shared with the community. That's not community engagement. It's, not, um, it's also not um, consumers participating in research as research subjects. So I get quite a bit, a few researchers coming up to me saying, I want to recruit more subjects to complete the surveys for, for my study. And I tell them that's not, that's not a partnership. That's not, that's not what community engagement is about. 
community engagement is about actually involving individuals in your research team or as stakeholders in your research project. And it's also not just raising awareness through different communication media. So these are all unidirectional or yeah, unidirectional ways of reaching out to the community. What we want, what we want is a discussion, a two-way conversation. There's different levels of the value and the importance or the, the benefits that consumer engagement can bring to a research project. And they can be in different categories. So there can be, you know, ethical, ethical values or ethical um, benefits to engaging with consumers and community members. Um, you know, uh, the community members have the right to be involved in the publicly funded research that's conducted about them. Um, it reduces the power imbalance between researchers and patients or community members. So it essentially it acknowledges that they're a member of the team um, and that their contribution is valued just like any other stakeholder around the table. And it also states that um, people have the right to participate in the planning and implementation of their healthcare. At an organizational level, there's benefits of doing consumer engagement as well. The more uh, and more and, and, and more meaningful consumer engagement, uh, I guess, opportunities increase the likelihood that um, you receive funding for your projects because it increases the likelihood that the project is actually um, re um, relevant and addresses the actual needs of the community. Um, by doing more consumer engagement in your project, you increase the public confidence of, um, of your research. And also by doing this type of work, you improve the accessibility of the research that you're doing. So is it, 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 be, it then becomes more accessible to the people who will actually benefit from the research. At an individual level, there's benefits for the researchers, but also for the community members. So for the researchers, they'll see that their project uh, maybe increases in ethical acceptability. Um, in some clinical studies, it's been shown, um, and clinical trials, it's been shown that engaging consumers um, very early on from the start of their project actually increases and improves the recruitment of research participants to their study by, um, you know, improving the way that consent forms are written or even engaging community members as the recruiters for the project. Um, it improves the cultural appropriateness of the project, the validity, and the ability to um, disseminate to a wider audience. And those are the benefits to the actual project, but the benefits of the actual researcher have been uh, studied as well, where, whereby researchers can gain confidence in their work, where they develop trusting relationships with the community. And in terms of the community members, they um, studies have shown that um, it improves the quality of life of um, some some community members who are involved in in research. Um, they become more empowered because they um, they have an increased sense of purpose and giving back to the community. Um, you know, after having had a lived experience with a specific disease or or, or caring for someone who's gone through um, um, some health problems. They also gain capacity for um, research, research skills and, and literacy skill, research literacy skills. So there's different levels of part of participation or engagement. Um, and as I was saying earlier, consumer engagement is not one directional. So it's not just disseminating results uh, of a study. So that would be at the information stage where we see that you know, the researcher is being the big dot only share information to the community. That's just information. The same can be said from the consultation phase um, or this consultation level of engagement, whereby the researchers gain um, information from consumers or the community, but there's no actual conversation. When we start seeing engagement is um, from the involvement stage to collaboration and empowerment. And these are stages where we actually see a, 
a conversation happen between re the research teams and the community members. And I think what Nadia was talking about with the PhD study that she was involved with, they were really at a high level of engagement, like, you know, between collaboration and empowerment. I think Julie had quite a bit to do with like the decision making in the project was really involved in the actual committee or the advisory committee for the PhD students. So it was really, you know, a high level of engagement. Um, but you can also have, um, you know, in the involvement um, phase, having, you know, discussion groups that inform the research project or inform the research priorities um, and the collaboration group having someone who's part of the research team but maybe not taking the decisions so there's different ways that you can engage with community members throughout um, throughout your project and it's really important as researchers to understand why you want to involve members of the public in your research and um, this will help you think about who you want to involve and how you want to involve them in the research. So there's different methods you or different ways you can engage as researchers with community members. Um, and these are all, I guess, examples of different roles that community members can have in a research project. Um, so you can have um, you know, research buddies who are uh, community members who will um, be paired with a researcher throughout the research project um, who can bounce off ideas. You can have people who will do uh, document reviews, so looking at consent forms, um, grant applications, or any patient-facing uh, documentation from a project. Um, you can have consumers and community members that are established in the research teams as a team member. You can have reference groups where you go to um, specific groups um, that are interested in, in, in different topics. For example, let's say uh, like a, a, an advocacy group or um, um, for different, different health um, topics. You can form a steering panel um, of community members and researchers that will help in the decision making of the project. You can have advisory councils who provide advice. So there's really different ways that you can engage with community members throughout a research project. I often get basic researchers telling me, so what? I don't, I, my research doesn't, um, I, I don't engage with with um, you know, I don't have to recruit people for my for my studies. My work is really lab based, um, or my work is very heavily um, you know data analytic. So why would I engage with community members um, if I'm so re so far removed from um, from that stage? Well, I always tell them that you, it's always important to uh, engage with the people who, in the end, no matter how how far removed you are from the translation of your project to the actual application of it in practice. It's so important to understand what are the consumer needs? Um, is, is your research topic relevant to the community? Um, are there maybe ways that um, in having a discussion group with a group of community members who are affected by your research topic can maybe highlight new research directions? Something that Nadia said in her presentation that I really liked was not to be too prescriptive and how right from the get go, they got together and had a discussion about, okay, well, maybe the research questions that we had pre established, maybe they aren't the research questions that we should go for. Maybe we can talk about other things. So the priority setting phase is really important. In the application and design, um, there's different ways that community members can be involved in basic research as well, you know, writing lay material um, in different applications, um, patient facing information. Uh, if you are to disseminate results to the community, then engage, engage community members to write those aspects of your project. Finally, in the dissemination phase, it's important to involve community members to identify the key message of the project. So kind of wrapping up, having a, a you know, looking back in the project, how is this still relevant for the community? Um, can we tailor this message to different audiences? Um, and can we work together in uh, writing up this study? 
So these are all different ways that community members can be engaged with research that's maybe a bit more removed from, um, um, you know, clinical research or um, research that really engages um, patients and carers. So there's different roles that community members can have throughout the research project. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but throughout all the different phases of a research project, you know, from the thinking and the planning to collecting the data to analyzing the data, writing and publishing the results and then sharing its impacts. There's different ways that community members can be involved in a research project as partners, as team members, as stakeholders. Another aspect that researchers come to Health Translation SA for is wanting support for the grant application processes. More and more nowadays, we see funding agencies requiring or really promoting consumer engagement in, um, in the application process. Um, each funding opportunity is going to have different requirements and expectations. And what they really want to see is how the research team includes community members or consumers as active members of the research team with their consent, obviously. Um, because I have research teams that come to me and say, oh, you know, we'll involve two consumers. And I say, well, have you spoken to people? Have you, have you told them that you want to be engaged with them or not? So we go through a recruitment process together. I help the research teams think about what is it that they want to achieve from this engagement to actually make it meaningful and, um, and, 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 and valuable for everyone around the table? Um, and it's really important to, to remind research teams to keep community members and consumers updated. It can be a really long lead in from the time you submit a grant application to the time you actually get funding. And it's important to just like any other member of, of the research team, keep people updated um, about whether you get the funding or don't, um, and if you do, how you will engage with them throughout the project. So for recruitment, I'm just going to enter into some, um, I guess, how to, um, how to points. So first, I want to cover recruitment just quickly. As a research team, and if you're thinking about engaging with community members in your research team, you have to understand why you want to involve members of the public in the research. It's important to know what experience you're seeking in community members for it to be a good fit. You have to want to work with these with with people um, who um, who will be, you know, who have something to contribute to the project, whether it be by uh, lived experience, whether it be by previous research experience that they have, um, and establish together what role everyone's going to have around the table. So what role are the, the, you know, the, the researchers going to have? Are there students in the team? What's their role? What's the role of the community members? How, are, um, how is everyone going to interact? And by engaging with community members, how will they be supported if this is their first time engaging in research? Do they have a contact person um, that they can comfortably uh, communicate with and ask questions to? How many people do you wish to recruit on your study um, as, as community members? There's different ways to do this. And if you're in South Australia, at Health Translation SA, we have a community interest register. We have about um, 98 to 100 active registrations currently of people who've expressed interest in joining research projects in various topics like diabetes, heart, uh, cardiovascular research, cancer. Um, and so it's important for researchers to you know, reach out to us and say, hi, I'd be really interested in recruiting um, someone for my research on X topic. In terms of reimbursement, we really advocate and we really encourage research teams to reimburse community members who are engaged in their project because it's an acknowledgement of their time, their contribution and the expertise that they can provide to the project. There's different policies that exist out there here in, 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 at HTSA. We use the summary consumer and community engagement policy and it's based on the SA Health sitting fees policy. But I'm sure if you're joining from another state, there must be policies that are um, 
uh, aligned to your state as well. And there's different tools and supports um, for researchers um, that are available. So there's the senior project officer. So if you're in another state, I'd encourage you to um, look up their, your local uh, translation center um, or in a university. If you, there's other research teams that have done consumer engagement and chat to them, uh, share your experience and ask them what, how, what they did and how it worked. Um, and maybe they, they can help you. At HTSA, we also have the consumer, the community engagement in research toolkit. So that's a, a place on our website where we have a ton of resources that can help people start their consumer engagement um, work, whether it be community members or researchers. So there's tools for everyone. And also for com community members um, starting their engagement with the research um, that we do here, we provide a community orientation guide. So this is something that helps community members um, be more familiar with the research institute, um, with their roles, with um, the, the summary framework around consumer engagement. And these are just some resources that are quite interesting for um, different types of research that have engaged with community engagement or with consumers in their projects. So that's it for me. And I will welcome any questions at the end of the presentation or at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Agostina. That was really helpful um, and a helpful overview and also letting us know about those tools and supports that are available. That's great. Um, we haven't got any questions popping up in the chat box yet, and I'm mindful that we're running a little bit over, over time. So I'm going to go straight to Julie and perhaps we'll hold any questions over for the um, sort of end of the webinar so that people who are able to stay on can um, sort of discuss um, answers to any questions that people might have. Um, Julie, if you're happy to go ahead. Yes, hello. Now just bear with me while I try and share my screen and can everybody see that? I can. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands we meet on today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. So research involves bringing together people with the right mix of diverse expertise to focus on understanding a problem or finding solutions. Combine our lived and life experience with your specialised training, knowledge and skills in respectful, collaborative, constructive team environment. It's the right recipe, the right ingredients. What could possibly go wrong? Oops. Sorry, I'm just... Okay. Well, not involving your consumer advisors from the very beginning is what could go wrong from the outset. Bring consumers into the team for co-design from the outset. Without consumers, who are the people being affected most directly by your research, you don't have the right people on your team. Students and early careers researchers need to see and experience co-design as the normal way to do research. If you're already halfway into your plan without involving consumers, well, don't despair, but don't wait. It's never too late to get started. Anyone can co-design, right? It's been published. It must be true. So moving on with your consumers on board, even knowing co-design principles doesn't always play out well in practice. Our introduction to researchers often starts like this. We're going to design the study together. Feel free to chip in at any time if you have any questions as we go through this proposal. Oh, you didn't understand those words or acronyms. Uh, anything else you didn't understand? Anyway, don't be deterred or discouraged. Um, by getting off to a rough start. And as Nadia told us, it can actually lead to um, a change of mind and a, and a better outcome. For us, co-design is about building two-way relationships, which encourage and foster the exchange of understanding, generates ideas, solutions, or knowledge to improve outcomes for something that we care about. We have skin in the game. We want our lived experience to be valued as equal to other kinds of knowledge. We're also volunteers. We're contributing to your careers. We're giving up our time at the times and time frames imposed on us with costs to travel to your office and to print your correspondence, pay for our home office equipment and supplies. 
Although um, actually since COVID, probably everybody understands this aspect a bit better now, what it's like working in isolation, not as part of the workplace team, not entirely sure what you expect of us, balancing it with our other roles and in and around our wellness and illness. But hopefully we can make a difference together from this research and we're gaining experience in learning and in personal satisfaction. For all of us, it involves working together, being part of the process with two-way engagement, trust, fostering relationships, respect, co-learning, active participation, and shared decision-making in the generation and application of the knowledge. We build shared understanding and empathy over time. These relationships can be short-term or long-term, and they may evolve and change over time as mutual capability and collaboration grows or priorities change. And it's not everybody's cup of tea to want deep or long commitment or involvements. There's no one size fits all. Acknowledge your consumer's contributions and at the end of the study, reflect and evaluate together on how this could have been improved in future and also celebrate achievements together. Because our preparedness to be involved in research again depends on how satisfactory the experience was. Um, Agostina talked about the levels of consumer participation, the two-way exchange and co-design and she referred to the power imbalance. So to illustrate this just again, um, you know, the size of those circles indicate the power balance. And for example, with inform, that usually means researchers telling consumers, you choose what, how, when, all power with researchers. And it's, and it's more about the balancing of up of this as you go through the in, engagement um, levels. And throughout, the research cycle of any project or study, there might be many different levels and forms of consumer engagement that are appropriate at different stages. Very quickly, I want to present the levels of participation in a different way to emphasise the very small number of people, of consumers at the top pointy end of the triangle who are capable and willing to become heavily involved as cancer research collaborators at the partnership or consumer led level. However, a matching extra effort from researchers and research organisations is also required to support this deeper level of consumer involvement. It amazes me, there's so many people affected by cancer, but why are so few motivated and willing to even participate in focus groups or surveys? We must find creative different ways to engage more people and hear experiences from those hard to reach um, groups. So I want to turn now to my a specific example from my own personal experience. My interest and commitment comes from being a cancer survivor. And this has definitely sharpened my resolve and the urgency to do more than just carry on with life as before. I also bring my trial participant experiences. I'm not an empty vessel just filled by my cancer though. And I come with other life experiences from having degrees in science and public health. I've worked in hospitals, in primary care and, and university settings. So research was never a foreign landscape to me, nor was medical language. My role and involvement with Cancer Voices is also an important underpinning, providing networks, two-way information sharing with consumers and others, leadership opportunities, and reasons to keep up to date and active around consumer issues. For more than 10 years, I've accumulated many different roles to assist in research. And I think that research that I think will lead to better cancer outcomes. And I stress that for whatever form of consumer engagement format, it must be fit for purpose because there's no one size all. And the relationship, it's about relationships that must provide mutual reward for both the consumers and the researchers involved. So I want to start by describing the consumer advisory group role I play for POGOG, POCOG and I joined in this in mid-2010. They're a group of about 10 cancer survivors, carers, um, with different cancer types, circumstances from around Australia, contributing what we know from our lived experience and via our personal networks. We provide a brain's trust of consumer advice to the multiple researchers and to POCOG as an organisation you get our diversity of viewpoints from a group of consumers who have grown up with you in experience and expertise. The POCOG consumer involvement process has evolved over the years 
from consult with us just commenting on proposals to now it's much more collaborative engagement um, from the, right from the concept ideas stage onwards with us working alongside clinicians and researchers. POCOG was probably the leader of the National Cancer Trials Groups in this regard. From our consumer perspective, it's collaborative, supportive, it's a learning process on many levels, and we also hear from other consumers' perspectives. It can be challenging at times of high demand to manage the workload, but having a team of consumers means that we can share that and cover for each other. I think it's a bit of a problem for you researchers, though, that um, we're mostly long-term survivors if we don't have that fresh coalface insights of more recently diagnosed patients. Um, POCOG developed the current consumer advisory group terms of reference, um, the process for recruitment, training, coordination and communication. So there's organisational overheads um, to have a consumer advisory group. Now, moving across to the research buddy role. This is a deeper and ongoing commitment that may not start out this way with this intention, but it grows over time with the chemistry, the mutual respect and the benefits developed from the relationship. It could be an individual or a group who buddy up with a consumer. With regular contact, deeper understanding, it can spark co-creation of novel ideas or research directions. I'll skip over the consumer co-supervisor and walk and talk for the moment. Um, I also am an associate investigator, active participant on many projects during groups, and I'm learning more about the reality and the challenges of conducting research. Add to this, um, I'm an associate investigator involved in the development of many research grant applications. Um, and as Agostino mentioned, it really would be nice if people remember to let your consumers know when you hear the outcome of your, your funding applications. Now, most rewarding research role for me has been as a consumer co-supervisor for Imogen's PhD, developing a core outcome data set for monitoring survivorship at the population level. I believe this work has potential to provide incredibly valuable information about long-term cancer survivorship in terms of the quality of our life and not just the quantity, and hence inform services and support needs. Imogen's poster at the recent survivorship conference describes consumer involvement throughout her research cycle stages. For over three years, I felt an equal partner in Imogen's supervisory team. We met usually monthly and we all shared the challenges and decisions at difficult steps along the way, or contributed uniquely where we could. I've learned why research takes so long, particularly waiting for publication after the, even the results are in. Imogen will never know any other way of working than having a consumer as part of the team. And yes, she went the extra mile by joining our Cancer Voices walking groups, where I feel she learned so much more by osmosis just by regularly hanging out with us. I applaud the team, Imogen, Marion, Nadia and Amanda, for having the courage to involve a consumer partner. And as you've seen, um, Imogen's done a terrific job publishing four papers just over the course of her PhD. For me, it's been unique to see this project through all the way from inception to completion and be invited to Imogen's graduation tomorrow as a member of her team. As I said, it's not everyone's cup of tea to have such deep commitment and responsibility, but for me, it's been very rewarding. A novel engagement strategy that I initiated is walk and talk with cancer researchers. Since 2019, consumers and researchers have the opportunity to meet in a regular face-to-face informal, unstructured, out of work setting. One hour per week of walking, networking, exchanging knowledge and experiences. As Nadia said, some collaborations, new directions and even projects have arisen already from this, along with deeper understanding and broadening scope of all participants' knowledge, including the value of hearing our lived experience. Results from this are not immediate and it's impossible to quantify, but we all feel it's been worthwhile. I've invited clini clinical policy and management staff to come along as well, but um, that's had very limited response. Um, they like the idea, but you know, they're always too busy. So don't underestimate consumers' knowledge, skills and capability to go beyond what you expect. A recent example of consumers leading attention to a research topic, two consumer advisory group members, Brian Wall and I, 
collaborated to suggest investigating iron deficiency as a factor contributing to worse chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. We gathered and presented evidence and presented it to the inaugural ideas workshop of the gastrointestinal trials group, presented this as a poster at a COSA conference, and by good luck, actually, had this taken up for investigation by a study that was underway at the time. And it was found to be a risk factor. So consumers collaborating, to get, collaborating together and working with, with researchers in a whole range of ways can lead to improvements and positive results. We've brought together lab scientists to meet with our social science or clinical research college, colleagues to address questions that would never have thought of examining. Have the courage and commitment to work with us in respectful, collaborative, constructive co-design. Value our knowledge and lived experience, and we all might be surprised by what we can achieve together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. That was great to um, hear your consumer perspective. Um, and I'm really, really um, impressed, particularly, you know, looking at the way that um, you uh, came up with the idea that about iron deficiency and that's been found to be a risk factor. I think that's just one example of the many ways in which um, consumer involvement in research can be so valuable and certainly so much more than um, just a consulting role. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. Um, there have been a few uh, questions popping up in the chat box. Um, one is from Sarah from Ballarat, um, saying that she's looking at um, engaging consumers in evaluation and co-design um, and would like uh, people's thoughts about hand-picking consumers with a demonstrated interest in that area um, in, in comparison to casting a wide net um, to find consumers. Um, does anybody have, a, um, I guess, an answer or would they like to share their thoughts on that question? Um, Agostina, perhaps I'll ask you first. Sure. Um, I think there's different ways that you can go about recruiting consumers onto a project. The way that we tend to do it here in SA is um, we advertise through our community interest register or um, our partner organizations that have community, I guess, databases like the LHNs. Um, they have, you know, groups of consumers who've uh, expressed interest in being engaged in this, these types of, um, of, uh, of initiatives or, or projects. And then it's really important to actually, um, I, tell, I'll tell my re I tell my research teams that um, it's like hiring someone that you want to work with. It's, it's really important to know and understand what it is that you're looking for. What kind of experience are you looking for in, um, in, in a consumer joining your project, but also what, what do you want to get um, out of it for the project? What is it that you're looking for? So recruiting with that mindset, um, it really helps you, I guess, um, even if you cast a wide net, then actually um, call people back for an interview or a sh or short chat to see if it can be a good fit for the project because you have to remember that you have to you have to want to work with this person or these people if you're recruiting multiple people onto a project. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Agustina. That's really helpful. No worries. Okay. Um, and we have a question for Julie here from Rebecca. Um, whether or not you have any tips for engaging consumers from lower SES backgrounds or Indigenous Australians in research, are there any organised groups representing consumers from those backgrounds that we could possibly tap into? Um, I wish I knew. Um, well, in, in terms of the Indigenous um, groups, um, um, there at SAMRI, <laughs> there's an Aboriginal um, research unit called Wadley Paringa and um, so I think that's probably the f you know, very good place to, to start and mm. mindful of the survivorship conference um, presentations and some previous work that we've done with um, cancer conversations in Aboriginal communities I, th I think you know if you're going to be working with Indigenous Australians then you need to be guided very much by their advice there and um, so I um, 
it's about going going to them as well and and similarly for the lower socioeconomic backgrounds so don't don't expect them to come to you and if you do have somebody who can be a, a networker or a broker and that can kind of be a step along the, the to, to help form those connections I think that's the the, the best way to 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 get started um, to start to build a relationship and, and then it will snowball and as you know as Nadia said it's the getting started that's the the, the forming that's the very first the most difficult part um, so be creative and think of multiple different ways to actually form some relationships to get that started by going out into those communities and listening to people um, I mean when we when we commenced our cancer conversations that was back in 2010 um, Ashley walked out into the parklands and sat down and spoke to a group of Ad Aboriginal people about cancer and you know said just started talking in an ordinary normal sort of way with them and then they said oh you should come and talk to my sister she's had cancer you should come and talk to other people and so it it began by just an ordinary relationship being formed so so don't try to overthink it I guess is my message all right great thank you Julie um in the absence of being able to spot another specific question, I realise we're running over time, but if people have time, I have one more question um, open to the group, but I think I'd like most of all to direct it to you again, Julie. Um, and that is, um, you know, when we have uh, consumers involved in a research team as a, as a co-supervisor or what happens more commonly is that a consumer is involved as an associate investigator, how can I make sure that the consumers on my team feel that they, their contribution is valued and make sure that they feel comfortable contributing um, and respected in their contribution when, for example, they might be the only non-academics on the team? It, I think it depends. Well, why would you only have one if it's mm. particularly if it's somebody that has has not had a lot of prior experience of, of mm. working with researchers? So there's always the opportunity for um, you know several researchers to to be to oh, sorry several consumers one to be mentoring another one so that you you know you're constantly thinking about how you're you're building and supporting the 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 person who um, or both of you know, all of your consumers that are involved, um, but just regular communication and, uh, you know, you, you might, like I showed with that inverse triangle, there's a small number of people that can operate or, or want to operate at that high level, but it, it actually involves a lot more from you as well to involve them in a, in a co-design manner. So um, it, you might have to go a bit further with, um, in terms of efforts, to make sure that they're feeling involved and engaged and that they're not too shy to, to speak up and, and say what they feel um, mm -hmm. or concerns and that they understand everything that's going along that they need to. But, uh, you know, I, th I think it's just about um, checking in frequently and um, as you build up that relationship of trust and mutual respect, it will, you, you'll, you'll know. They'll have the confidence to then tell you if it's not, <laughs> if it's not working. Yep. Yeah, all right, excellent. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, Nadia, um, you've got a note there that you're happy to quickly answer. I can't quite track which question. But did you need, would you like to chip in? Uh, just in relation to the low SES, um, mm. I had some experience recently where I was doing a project um, wanting to engage with people from low SES backgrounds as so cold communities and um, migrants as well, new migrants and refugees around contact tracing for COVID. Mm. And I'd never, um, you know, tr tried to engage with those groups before. And so one um, thing I found useful is I emailed a whole lot of organisations who support those groups, just cold call. And um, I think it was about five or six and I got one response from that 
um, just saying, yeah, really interested. Um, we have um, a group that we work with. And then they put me in contact with um, uh, a leader of the uh, group of new arrivals from Nepal. So they have a community group and there's a, and the, they work with the group, um, sort, of a, sort of a leader of a community leader of that group who runs um, support groups. And so sort of I was put in contact with that person and um, explained the research and then he was happy to coordinate um, a focus group with people from the community. And um, I was sort of skeptical about how this was going to go because they didn't speak English and we needed a translator, but they organized that. They were happy to support that. And this group were amazing. Like they were so happy to be um, asked about COVID and contact tracing and to talk about the issues that they had with it and how QR codes were, you know, didn't work for them and what they thought would be helpful. And it was, it was just, I had no connections, but just cold calling. And then if you can find a community leader that is interested, that can open up a lot of opportunities. Um, and we're able to get information from people who didn't speak English. So um, it can, can happen. Um, you just have to put the feelers out, I think. Mm. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um. I think we've probably come to the end of this um, seminar. We have run over time already and um, I haven't seen any new questions popping up in the chat unless I'm missing something. Thank you everybody um, for attending today and a, a huge thank you in particular to our presenters. Um, I've really found each of your presentations really informative, really valuable and I'm quite certain that a lot of other people viewing the presentations um, will have found the same. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yes, okay. thank you, Poe Cole. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to Bonnie, and, who's been organising yeah. everything in the scene, uh, behind the scenes. Right, love